And why would you then eat this meat rather than before? So is it, sure. yeah, yeah, explain that to me, sorry. <laughs> sure, I, I didn't stop eating meat because I don't like meat. I stopped it because I, I you know, want to uh, prevent animal cruelty and the environmental ills that we've been discussing. So uh, if meat is available that didn't cause harm to animals and that caused very little harm to the planet, I'm happy to eat it. And so probably about 10 times now, uh, I have eaten um, cultivated duck, beef, chicken, liver, pork, uh, even foie gras. And Welcome to the Prime Life Project podcast, a place to help you unlock your full potential, both mentally and physically, to become the best version of you. Welcome back to another episode of the Prime Life Project podcast. I'm your host, Daniel James. And today, uh, I've got a little bit of a different topic today. Obviously, you know, this podcast is very heavily focused around mental health. But for me, it's all about introducing you guys to different points of view and get you guys thinking a little bit differently. So today, we're going to be talking about uh, food sustainability and alternative to meat, which for anybody listening to this podcast and is a long term listener, I, I am massively pro meat. I love my meats. So I've already uh, spoken to my guest today to say that I'm going to be on the, the, the um, devil's advocate side should we say however i've done a lot of research into my guest today and i'm really looking forward to having this conversation with him because he brings up some really good points so i'm looking forward to going down this rabbit hole with him so my guest today is paul shapiro who's the author of a national best-selling clean meat how growing meat without animals will revolutionize dinner and the world he's also the ceo of better meat co and four-time tedx speaker and the host of business for good podcast and a long-time leader in food sustainability paul welcome to the podcast Daniel, it's my pleasure to be on with you, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, no, my absolute pleasure. So uh, I don't really know where we're going to go today. Like I said, we, we sort of know roughly where the conversation is going to flow, but I'm sure I'm going to have a lot of questions along the way. But my first thing I really want to do is take my audience back. Uh, and where did this all start for you? Like, are you a meat eater? Are you a vegetarian? Like, what's got you into this whole space of um, meat and sustainable food? Yeah, sure, Daniel. So I, I did grow up eating meat, but when I was 13, I started uh, learning about some of the things that I didn't like so much because I really liked the taste of it um, and I, I enjoyed eating meat, but I didn't like the way that animals were treated and I didn't like the way that meat took such a huge footprint on the planet in terms of the land and the water needed to produce it. Um, and then also, do you remember uh, Carl Lewis? You remember he was like the, you remember him? No? All right. What, 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 was, well, what was his thing? Carl Lewis was like the Usain Bolt of this era, like back in the 90s, like in the early 90s. He was like the best athlete in the world, huge gold medalist. He had won like more gold medals than anyone at that time. He was big in the long jump, 100 meter, 200 meter, but he was an American athlete, track and field athlete. And he was like the Usain Bolt of that era, like the most well medaled Olympian of that era. And, um, I have always like worshiped Lewis. I mean, he was like this God to me, you know, I had him on like posters on my wall and all that. And I read this interview in which he talked about how his best Olympic years were after he became vegan. Now, keep in mind, this is like the early nineties. Mm. And this is, you know, somebody, he's not a long distance runner. This is a power sprinter. And I was like in shock because come on, I was a young kid. I was a young teenager. And I knew that I thought, yeah, it's better uh, not to torment animals, but I thought there might be some sacrifices to your health that you'd be making if you weren't eating meat. And here was the best athlete in the world talking about how not only was he vegan, but he also was attributing some of his athletic success to being vegan. And that really pushed me over the edge. And so back in 1993, uh, I stopped eating animals. Um, but I will say, Daniel, uh, since then, meat consumption has only skyrocketed, yep. you know, like uh, people, you know, the meat demand has continued to rise, both in, in Europe and the United States and China and India, Brazil. Well, why do you, why do you, gonna... you think that is? Because like I said, there's been a big push in, I've heard you talk about this on your TED Talks, but there's a big push yeah. in obviously the Western world for veganism, yeah. all that sort of stuff. But why do you think then that meat right. consumption has gone on the rise? Yeah, it's a great question, Daniel. So there's lots of theories about it, but pretty much what the evidence shows is that generally speaking, not everybody, but most people are going to eat about as much meat as they can afford. And so as poorer nations start building a middle class, like in China and India and Brazil, one of the very first things that people do when they start getting more money is eating more meat because mm. it takes it takes a lot more resources to produce meat than it does to produce plant-based foods typically. And so that's why it costs more. And that's why when people start getting more dollars in their pockets, they start eating more meat. And so I would be thrilled if people were interested in eating bean and rice burritos and lentil soup, like that would be awesome. I think that'd be great. 
The sad thing is that uh, most people want to keep on eating a lot of meat. In fact, about as much meat as they can get their hands on. And so that's why I believe that we need to recreate meat experiences without animals. So it's kind of like in the same way, Daniel, if you walk into a room and you flick on a light switch, you know, you just want light. You want an illuminated room. You're not mm -hmm. thinking whether it's coming from coal or oil or solar or wind. You just want light. Well, I think the same is so with most people when they eat meat. I would bet that when you're eating meat that you're probably not thinking, ah, oh, I'm so glad an animal was slaughtered for this. <laughs> you probably, you know, right? You probably don't think about it at all. And if you do, maybe you would even think, you know, I would rather an animal not be slaughtered. And so I believe that just in the same way that we can produce energy without fossil fuels, we should be able to produce meat without animals. And there's lots of ways to do that. I'm psyched to talk with you about those, but that's what I've really devoted my life toward because I, I doubt that people are going to go vegetarian and mass. I think most people want to continue enjoying meat and we need to provide it just in the same way. Most people want to keep on driving and flying. We got to provide ways to make cars without fossil fuels. Uh, well, let's produce meat experiences without animals. I think it's one of the biggest things as well uh, from your TED Talks, because I listened to two of your TED Talks, you said, uh, obviously on the intro, I said you did four, but I could only find two that I was listening to. And you made a really good point about mm. uh, the whales and how basically hunting whales was the norm. Uh, but then now you wouldn't even think about hunting whales to get all the stuff from it to, to, to use to, to light your room and stuff like that. And I thought that was a really good way to actually think about it. Like the fact of actually, and you, again, credit to you you got me to think about it and i was just like i know there's a whole point of your intro because you walked on this massive whale harpoon and i thought bloody hell that's that <laughs> that's the way you make an intro on the, on, the, on the speech and i thought well actually you've made a very good point here so your sort of premise was actually in the future like this will be a thing of the past like actually raising these animals and stuff like that but i think you hit on some other stuff so i just want to sort, sort of go down the rabbit hole of why do you think uh, that we need to actually be looking at more sustainable alternatives to meat so obviously i, I understand the premise of uh, how animals are treated so i as a meat eater do not agree with how animals are treated. That's one thing that I will agree on when it comes to vegans, ve uh, vegetarians and vegans. I completely agree with that. But why should we really care about the sustainability of these different meat options? Why is that a thing? Sure. And I I'm eager to answer your question, Daniel. And I also want to talk about what you just mentioned about whaling. But I'll tell you, you know, look, the planet's not getting any bigger, right? So humanity's footprint on the planet is getting a lot bigger, but the planet itself isn't getting any bigger. And one of the primary ways that we leave that footprint is through our food print, principally in the amount of meat that we eat. It just takes a vast amount of land, a large amount of water, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and more to raise animals for food. In fact, the number one cause of deforestation on the planet is raising animals for food, either to create uh, pasture land for them or to create cropland to feed crops to farm animals. So the number one cause of deforestation is raising animals for food. It's a driving uh, cause of wildlife extinction. And in fact, it's a big cause of pandemic amplification. So even the United Nations just put out a report called Preventing the Next Pandemic. And the UN looks at what are the top reasons we might have another pandemic. And they cite number one, the number one reason the UN says that we might have another pandemic is increasing demand for animal protein. Number two is the intensification of agriculture, meaning confining animals in tighter and tighter spaces so that they're living wing to wing or snap to snout. Number three, is the bushmeat trade, so killing wildlife for their meat. And so that means the numbers one, two, and three reasons the United Nations says we might have another pandemic are all relating to humanity's desire to eat meat. So my view is if people want to eat meat, we're not going to be able to prevent that, right? So why can't we satiate humanity's meat tooth, so to speak, without animals? Mm. Like that would help to solve this problem, to give people the meat they want without the need to raise animals in the same way that we can create light without fossil fuels and cars that don't drive on oil. Why don't we create meat without animals? And there's lots of ways to do it. Now, on the whaling point that you brought up, Daniel, I just want to say, you know, if this were 150 years ago, uh, we'd all be lighting our homes with whale oil. It was a huge industry. That's how we lit our homes. And there were lots of concerns about the sustainability of whaling. Um, but nobody stopped whaling back then in the 1800s because they cared about whales. They stopped because kerosene was invented and was a cleaner, cheaper way to light our homes. And so the invention of kerosene rendered whaling totally obsolete. And now you fast forward to today and we still have a big industry of boats that go out to find whales, except now they're going out to photograph them rather than to hunt them. Mm. And if you had told somebody 150 years ago that there'd be an industry of people who would get on boats merely to look at whales, not to kill them, but merely to look at them, they would have thought you were insane. And now if you were to ask somebody today, how, you know, if they found out that they were lighting their homes with whale oil, you would think they are insane. Uh, similarly, if, you know, you let's say left this interview today and to go home, you got in a horse-drawn carriage, you know, people would think of you like, what is this guy doing? 
Uh, and yet for, uh, for hundreds, for even thousands of years, horses were the way that we got around. We had, there's a whole industry of creating whips just to beat these animals, to force them to carry us around. I mean, we really tormented these poor animals. And yet we didn't stop exploiting horses because people cared about them. We stopped because there was a better method of transportation invented that we call now the car. At the time, it was just called the horseless carriage. Now we call it a car. But, you know, it, it would be inconceivable for somebody today to get into a horse-drawn carriage as like some means of like, I mean, maybe they do it as like a tourist something, you know, a tourist event. Go around Central Park not, or something. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. It's like a quaint experience to remind ourselves of humanity's deep past. But Anyway, the point is like time after time, categories of animal exploitation have been ended, not because of humane concerns for the animals, that would be great, but because of technological innovation that renders the exploitation obsolete. Mm. And that's what we need to do for farm animals as well. So I think that's a, a key point here is what I liked about um, hearing you talk and your website and everything that your company is about, is that you're not actually going out of the way trying to force people to stop eating meat. Because as soon as you do that, it gets people's back up. And that's what annoys me about people trying to force me to do something. It's like, if you're trying to force me to do something, I'm going to dig my heels in a bit deeper. But I think what you're trying to do is yeah. just subtly just be like, maybe just try this instead. And like almost just put the alternative there and then almost get people off it. Like you said there, rather than the, the whale or you give them a better alternative and like, oh, this is loads better. Like, so they automatically make the, you, you get the consumer to make the decision themselves. So that makes sense rather than forcing it upon them. Is that kind of how your company is trying to go about it? Yeah, I think so. Um, what I recognize is that people want to eat meat and it's very hard to prevent people from doing what they want to do. That's just the way it is. Like, you, you know, you can't, you can't you pretend like we were dealt a different hand. Like we were dealt a hand of a species that really likes eating meat. That's just the way it is. Uh, I don't like it. I don't wish it were true, uh, but the reality is that's what happened. And I'm not suggesting that we should give up the things that we love any more than I'm suggesting that people not drive. You know, some people will say, oh, just, just walk and bike and don't drive. That's fine. That would be cool if people did that. But I think a lot of people want to drive. So let's figure out ways to make cars that don't run on, on fossil fuels. Similarly, lots of people want to eat meat. Let's figure out ways to make it. And there's lots of ways to do it. So you can grow meat from animal cells, which is the topic of my book that you mentioned. Can we talk about that? That's because that, that, I want to go. Yeah. To, that, that's going to be the, the, the next thing I want to talk about. About that. Obviously, I know we, sure. spoke, we spoke off air about mushrooms and stuff. So I do want to go down the plant based stuff yeah. as well. But this fascinate. Cool. This is fascinating me. And again, how you articulated it when I heard you talk about it kind of blew my mind a little bit. Because for me, to eat meat that's grown in a factory just blew my mind a bit and I was like that's weird but how you articulated it was completely different to what I've heard before so yeah what is this whole thing about like um uh, eating meat from animal cells can you can you explain that process to me uh sure so let me just be clear currently you were eating meat from animal cells uh it's just that they were cells were in, in a huge animal's body and then we slaughtered the animal and disassembled the animal uh and you're eating meat from factories right now uh, these animals are not raised on pastoral farms for the most part they're raised in big industrial factories so uh but let me put it this way. Before I tell you how it's done, I'm just going to give you a quick story. So if you go back to the 19th century, again, when whales were, dodg were dodging harpoons, the only way anybody had to get ice was from nature. You, know, you had to go out and harvest ice from frozen lakes and frozen rivers, and there were big boats that were insulated, and they would take this ice all around the world. I mean, there was an ice industry where we were shipping ice from North America all the way to India. Uh, interestingly, not for the Indians, but for the British colonists who, who were suffering in the subcontinental heat. Uh, but the point is that we had this big ice industry. And then you enter the advent of refrigeration. And all of a sudden, you had a way to make ice, not from nature, but from human-made technology. And the ice barons of that era were livid over what they called artificial ice. And they railed against it, saying it was unnatural. It went against God. It was something that had never been done before and that it was unsafe. And of course, now we all know that actually uh, so-called artificial ice is just fine. It's the same thing. It's, it's still ice. It's just made from human technology rather than from nature. And we all have artificial ice makers in our homes. We call them freezers. We don't think there's anything unnatural about it at all. And most of us would prefer to have uh, ice made by technology rather than risking it with ice that came from nature because we can filter and boil the water and so on beforehand to make sure that it is clean for us. So it's better. Uh, actually, the, the so-called artificial ice is actually better than ice from nature. Well, something is similar with meat. You know, for thousands of years, just like the only way we had to get ice was out of nature, the only way we've had to get meat is out of animals' bodies. Now, humanity has invented ways to produce real meat, not an alternative, not a substitute, but real animal meat simply grown from animal cells rather than from animal slaughter. And it is better. It is not just the same. It is better than meat from slaughtered animals. And I'll tell you why. 
if you think about, well, let me first tell you how it's done. So imagine that in, let's say a cow or even in your body, Daniel, you, you know, you do a hard workout and, or the cow gets injured or whatever. There are little millions of little satellite cells inside of your body that their only career path in life is to produce new muscle tissue. So when you do a hard workout, you get muscle tears. These are the cells in your muscle that are just sitting there waiting to produce new muscle for you. That's what all they do. The only thing they can ever do is produce more muscle. Well, that's what meat is, it's muscle. And so if you take a tiny little biopsy, like a sesame seed sized biopsy from a cow, inside of there, there are literally millions of these satellite cells and you can put them in a cultivator where it has the same temperature that the animal's body has. And those cells believe that they are still in the animal's body and they do exactly what they would do if they were in the body, which is produce new muscle tissue. And so this isn't science fiction. It's not something that could happen in the future. It's science fact already. There are many startups, dozens and dozens of them that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars collectively to grow real meat without animals. And they're doing it in ways that even now are cost effective. In fact, uh, one company called Future Meat Technologies in Israel just announced this week, we're recording this at the end of 2021, they just announced this week that they can grow a chicken breast for $1.70, a real chicken breast without the chicken, without harming a single chicken. Already in Singapore, they are serving it. You can go to a restaurant in Singapore and get real chicken meat that is grown without harming a single chicken as we speak right now, that's being sold by a company called Eat Just. So this is no longer science fiction. Again, it is science fact. And this is an industry that just in the same way that so-called artificial ice became just ice, I believe that this industry today, while we call it things like cultivated meat or clean meat, will just become meat. It'll just be meat in the future. And people will be so glad that we don't have to do it the old way where we were tormenting animals and destroying the planet to produce meat. Instead, we can do it in a much safer, much more humane, much more sustainable way. So then let me play devil's advocate with this then. So what about all the farmers and the companies and stuff like that, that currently they live off because of the amount of food that's been produced. Now I, I completely agree with the deforestation in Brazil yeah. and stuff like that. Like I think what's going on in Brazil with the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest is beyond mental. I, I can't comprehend that, but um, what, what, what about these, these farmers and stuff like that? Like what do you think, that it will do to the potential economy with all these people that potentially could lose their jobs. And yeah. because these farmers, generally, sure. some of them, you do have genuinely good farmers that do raise the animals well. I, I'm not saying that the majority isn't that way. The majority is, they're in pens. I do get that. But you do still have these good farmers that raise animals properly. What do you see the future uh, for them? Like, is it a case of they're going to have to, are they going to get a piece of this pie or are they going to have to completely shift into a new thing, like potentially with generations just lost? Yeah. So great question. So, you know, first and foremost, let me say, I, I totally agree with you. Nobody is uh, out there thinking like, oh, I'm going to become a, I'm going to become a far farmer because I'm a sadist and I want to harm animals. Like, I, I just don't think that's true. I think that there's been a lot of economic pressures that have led to this system, especially when you have no rules or, or virtually no rules for how animals are treated. And then there's a race to the bottom. That's what happens. So I think we should have rules for how animals can be treated. So that way a farmer who wants to treat their animals better isn't economically disadvantaged by others who want to cut corners. So first and foremost, let me get that out of the way. Second, uh, the, the reason that the Brazilian rainforest is being deforested uh, to produce pasture land and cropland for farm animals is because we in uh, both the United States and in Europe have already deforested our land to do the same. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like they're it's just further behind than we are in their deforestation. So I agree, it's horrible what's happening, but we already deforested Europe and the United States uh, primarily to grow animal feed and provide pasture land. So um, when the Brazilians say, hey, you guys already did this, why are you stopping us from doing it? We have to think, well, maybe we should reduce our own meat consumption because most of the Brazilian rainforest that's being deforested is not for Brazilian consumption. It's for exporting those soybeans or those uh, animal meat to uh, places like Europe and, and the U S. So I, I, you know, I think the way to stop it is to cut demand for animal slaughter. So now on to your real question, Daniel, what's going to happen. So, you know, look, first animal cells still need to eat, right? You're going to put them in a cultivator. They need nutrition just like they would if they're in the animal's body. So you're still farming in order to produce feedstock for those animals. You might be farming different things, but you're still farming. So in the same way, when people uh, started smoking less, uh, we grew less tobacco and people had to switch to other crops. Or even if you look in a non-agricultural context, um, we now have a, a lot of people who work in the digital film industry who didn't have these type of jobs working in print film. And you go back to the 1990s and 
You had uh, Kodak and Canon vying for supremacy in the print film market. And now, uh, obviously, Canon embraced digital and Kodak didn't because they thought it was going to cannibalize their core business of print film and negatives and chemicals and all the stuff that they used. And we all know what happened. Uh, Canon became the largest manufacturer of digital cameras and Kodak went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And so those in the agricultural community who put their head in the sand and they say, hey, we've always been slaughtering animals. We're going to continue always slaughtering animals. Those will be the Kodaks of the future meat industry. The Canons will be those who embrace this type of innovation and say, hey, we want to make meat in a better way. And just in the same way, like Canon still sells us the same thing. It's a way to capture our memories, right? We're still taking photos to capture our memories. It's just way better than having to wait hours or days to get our film uh, in the way that we used to do it 25 years ago. Well, similarly, we're still going to get the same experience. We're still going to enjoy eating meat. It's just going to be done in a much more efficient way. And so there will be new jobs in this post-animal economy. They just will be different in the same way that we have different jobs in the film industry or in the same way that Blockbuster got displaced by Netflix. And now we have different jobs in the streaming industry rather than people working in video stores. Like there's just differences that happen in the economy as technology and innovation render old forms of technology obsolete. Mm. And one of the most archaic forms of technology is raising and slaughtering animals for food. So when it comes to these... Um the sells the animals which again when you explained it it makes perfect sense to me and i'm i, I am i'm on board with it like if you can give me a steak that is a steak yeah. and no animal's been harmed brilliant um would they be genetically modified in any way so let's say for example like logically you're thinking in your head you want to get the finest organic grass-fed uh, cow and use those cells yeah. but is there then potential danger of this where again i'm, I'm going down a bit of a not conspiracy route, but like the food industry where they then add some things to it to make the meat taste better and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, actually, I just want yeah. the steak as a steak. Is there, yeah. is there any potential um, danger of that happening? Uh, would that be a thing or? Sure. So uh, I'm not aware of any of the companies in this space currently using genetic modification. It doesn't mean you couldn't do it, but none of them are uh, primarily for the concerns that you're raising, which is that, you know, that you'll get people who are suspicious of it, especially in Europe, where there's a lot of sentiment that's hostile toward genetic modification. So I think that there is um, a lot to be said on that particular issue, but I'll just leave it at, the, at that. I'm not aware of any of these companies doing that. Um, you don't need to do it in order to grow meat without animals. It's, it's not necessary. Um, you could do it and it might make it easier to do it, but it's not necessary. Uh, the companies aren't doing it to my knowledge. And then the question will become, um, you know, right now, like in the United States, uh, let's just if you think about like, if you're concerned about genetic modification, uh, nearly all of the crops that are being grown that are genetically modified are grown for farm animal yep, feed. Yep. So, you know, so if, if you really wanted to reduce the number of acres planted with genetically modified crops, uh, we should raise fewer animals because that's the real primary reason why we're doing genetic modification is for farm animal feed. Yep, no. uh, there are a few other, there's like a few examples like papayas and other like specialty crops, but for the most part, it's farm animal feed that's GM. Mm -hmm. No, that's it. <clears throat> and you can, I, 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 <laughs> Sometimes when I ask questions, I'm trying to ask a question to get the answer that I know is coming. And that was one of those ones where I was a bit like, <laughs> I was almost like just throwing, throwing the grenade in there to be like, right, let's just, let's just throw this in there, see nice. how this goes. Um, Good. I know obviously you're, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a vegan. Are you vegan or are you a vegetarian? Uh, so I've been a vegan for nearly 30 years. However, numerous times I've eaten cultivated meat. So that's real meat grown from animals. And so, so uh, that's my, my concern question. Is that's going to be my question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, what, so, yeah, what, so, so what is it like? Tell, tell me about that experience. Because to my knowledge, I've yeah. never eaten any of this meat. So, so then why would you right. then eat this meat rather than before? So is it, sure. yeah, yeah, explain that to me, sorry. <laughs> sure, I, I didn't stop eating meat because I don't like meat. I stopped it because I, I you know, want to uh, prevent animal cruelty and the environmental ills that we've been discussing. So uh, if meat is available that didn't cause harm to animals and that caused very little harm to the planet, I'm happy to eat it. And so probably about 10 times now, uh, I have eaten um, cultivated duck, beef, chicken, liver, pork, uh, even foie gras. And so like, these are all uh, foods that are now being made from animal cells. And why not? Like if somebody is a vegetarian or a vegan because of some personal identity reason, or maybe it's a religious or a spiritual reason, that's one thing, but that's not me. Uh, what I'm concerned about is animal welfare and the planet. And under, for, if those are your concerns, there's no reason not to eat this. Now, maybe you don't want to, like there may be some longtime vegetarians who just think, uh, I, I don't want that. And that's fine. But frankly, 
it's not for vegetarians. Like nobody is making these products for vegetarians. Nobody cares. They're not eating meat anyway. Yeah. Like the goal of this is to get, is to have meat consumers enjoy it. And so I don't care whether vegetarians and vegans eat this stuff. It means nothing. Like really the goal is whether uh, people like you, Daniel, are going to eat it. And I think that you will, not just you, but I think most people will. I, I think that there's just, when, when you have a better option, especially once it's cost comparable, there's a ton of people who are just going to say, why would I ever want to do it the old way? Like, why would we ever want to do what we do to animals? It's, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you know, these animals are locked up in cages so small. Many of them can barely move their whole lives. I mean, most people don't want to think about it. Um, but I, I really think that future generations are going to be pretty shocked by what we did to animals in our era, especially the animals we raise for food, who we treat worse than the most heinous criminals. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't take murderers and rapists and put them in jail cells so small they can't even turn around or they can't lift their arms like they're in an Iron Maiden, like, like a coffin, basically. Uh, yet that's what we do to animals who have committed no crime except for being born into the wrong species, so mm. chickens or pigs. And it's easy for us to say, oh, well, I don't agree with that. That I don't like, but, and then try to fill in the blank. But that's how the vast majority of these products are produced are on these industrial factory farms. And so I'm all for switching away from the systems to better systems of animal husbandry. That's great. I'm all for it. Um, but as you pointed out, that's nearly all meat production today. Mm. Uh, the vast majority of it is being produced in systems that most people would not want to witness, let alone would they want to participate in. And so I think, why not do this? Like, this is way better. Anybody who looks at this would say it's just naturally preferable to be able to get the foods that we want without conduce, without uh, without inflicting so much harm. So how far away is this? I know you're saying that it's happening in, uh, I think you said uh, Singapore and uh, other countries. Like how far away is this from actually becoming a main thing? Because obviously America's so much more um, meat heavy than let's say England, purely from the size of the country. So when is this yeah. going to become, like you said, there's a few startup companies. Like when is this going to become an actual thing where it's not startup companies, these are actually big companies. Like when is this actually going to be a thing where you go into a restaurant because i'm assuming right now if i go into a restaurant it would say it, does it have to say that it's a, uh, um cell grown meat or is there it, does it have to say that is my first question then my second question is um yeah how far away are we from actually seeing this become a thing where i go into uh, my normal restaurant let's say in america applebee's and all the steaks that are served there are this like, how far away is that yeah. Yeah. So first of all, most countries have no rules or regulations because these products aren't on the market yet. However, in the U.S., our Department of Agriculture is currently taking public comments on what to label this food. And most of the companies in this space think it should be labeled as cultivated meat. Um, it, it accurately describes the way it is. It is cultivated. It's grown in cultivators. That's what we're doing. Um, and, you know, there are some people who like the term clean meat, which is the, the title of my book. And I, I think it, it's a fine term. They like it because not only is it an allusion to clean energy, but it also is just cleaner. So if you think about it, like right now, if you have raw meat in the supermarket, you're really warned to treat it like toxic waste. You put raw meat in your basket, you're supposed to keep it segregated. You got to put it in different bags, bring it home. If it touches your counter, you got to disinfect your counter. If you touch raw meat with your hands, you got to wash your hands. All of that is because there is feces on the meat. So E. coli, salmonella, campylobacter, these are intestinal pathogens that can sicken us if we don't cook the crap out of the meat. You're literally cooking the crap out of the meat. Uh, whereas with clean meat, you don't have to worry so much about intestinal pathogens because you aren't growing intestines at all. You only have the muscle that we want. And so you don't need to worry as much about things like E. coli, which only grows in intestines. So that's one reason people like the term clean meat. However, the meat industry has uh, complained bitterly about that term, uh, saying that it implies that their meat is dirty. And so many of the companies have really gone toward the term cultivated meat now. And that's fine. I, I like it. I submitted comments to the Department of Agriculture and I advocated for cultivated meat also. Um, now, to answer your question about when this will be something that isn't niche, the meat industry is already getting involved in this. So uh, JBS, which is the largest meat producer on the planet, recently acquired a cultivated meat startup and is putting to, and it's putting $100 million toward creating its own cultivated meat facility. Uh, Tyson Foods, which is America's largest meat producer, has already made numerous investments in these type of startups. Uh, Cargill has done the same. And so the point is that this is no longer just uh, some entrepreneurs there. You now have the biggest meat companies on the planet that are actively investing in this because they want to be the canon. They don't want to be the Kodak. They want to diversify and innovate 
and to continue to create meat, uh, but just without animals. So I think because of those companies' involvement and the capital they're bringing, that you are going to see in the coming years these products starting to hit the market. How quickly it'll be on an Applebee's menu? I don't know, but I think it'll be on some menus within the next year or two. And uh, there have been lots of predictions that have been wrong about this. Like over the last 10 years, people have kept on saying, oh, I think it'll be three to five years out, three to five years out. And no matter when you get there, it's like everybody's saying, oh, three to five years out. So, you know, time will tell. But it is now on sale in, in Singapore. It's been on sale for about a year in Singapore. So that's a, a good sign. And uh, I suspect it'll be on sale, at least in some select restaurants. But that's just one way to produce meat without animals is using animal cells. As you alluded to, there's all, all these other ways. And so many of them are already on the market. So if you look at the plant-based meat options, which are not identical to animal meat, but they are uh, somewhat in their sensory perspective, similar to animal meat, um, those are now more widely available pretty much anywhere you go. And so uh, I think that there's going to be in the same way that we have like so all these alternatives to fossil fuels, you know, you've got wind, you've got solar, you've got geothermal and more. There's going to be lots of alternatives to factory farming of animals. There's going to be meat grown from animal cells, meat grown from plant proteins, meat grown from fungi proteins, and a whole variety of things that we can do that are going to uh, be on the market and that I think can do an even maybe even a more effective job in the near term of replicating meat without the need to grow animal cells. So I'm bullish on animal cell culture, but I think there's going to be uh, other ways that might be even more promising in the near term. So we spoke about this, uh, we had a previous guest on speak about mushrooms now, and again, you talk about mushroom alternatives to, to meat. And when you describe yeah. me there, just something about it didn't sit right with me, describing these plant-based things as meat. For me, meat is meat. And I hate, yeah. I hate, so I, I, I dated a vegan and she got me to try all these, these plant-based alternatives. And I get that they're nice. Don't get me wrong. Like hundred percent that they're nice. But for me, I think there was some bacon thing and it wasn't bacon. It didn't taste like bacon. The texture wasn't bacon. And I, I felt very offended that it was called meat. So, so, so with yeah. this, like what you're saying, it's like, I, 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 I love the fact that there's always different alternatives out there. Um, but I, my personal opinion is it shouldn't be called meat. What do you think about this? Sure. I, I, I think this should be called, so I understand the principle of them. But for me, having a mushroom steak, no matter how much it tastes like steak, is not going to be a steak, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. So that's a good question. I mean, I'm less concerned about what it's called, but I will say, you know, right now there's a big debate over this with milk as well. Like is, is oat milk or soy milk or almond milk? Is it milk? And, you know, the dairy industry touché. obviously T touché. says touché. no. Touché. Yeah. Touché. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so like, you know, is, is anybody actually confused if you buy coconut milk? Does anybody think, oh, this came from a cow? Like, I mean, I don't know. I don't think it's that confusing. You got those, uh, you got those, uh, those, those yeah. memes about almonds being milked, like with the yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> love that. Oh, I, I love that. I love this. Like, there's a really funny parody video of an almond milk farmer where the guy's like, he wakes up early to milk the almonds. It's so funny. I love it. Uh, but anyway, like you know, is anybody actually confused? Like, when anybody buys coconut milk, are they actually confused? I mean, similarly, like if somebody goes out and buys peanut butter, do they think, oh, this is butter? Oh, it's not actually butter. You know, like I mean, I just doubt it. If people buy a hot dog, do they think this is dog? Like, there's just <laughs> you know, there's just you know ways that we describe food to make it uh, clear like what it is. Now, I agree with you though, Daniel, that some of the products that have been on the market don't really do a good job of mimicking what people typically consider as meat, and especially in bacon, that's been a really hard one. Uh, I've never really had a bacon that I thought was identical to bacon from a pig. Um, but in some of the burgers, I really think they've come a long way. Mm. I think the companies like Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat really have come a long way in creating a burger experience that is pretty hard to tell the difference uh, between that and uh, meat from a slaughtered cow. And so uh, I think it's just a matter of time before these companies get better and better at mimicking that experience in the same way that, uh, you know, you consider, let's say, um, you know, uh, in the past, we had cars that were the uh, electric or the hybrid cars were in many ways inferior. Uh, and now we're starting to perceive them as not only as good, but even superior. You know, if somebody has a Tesla, it's perceived as being superior to a regular car. And that's why people pay more for it. So uh, I think over time, the, these products will get better and better. And then there will be less offense taken, like what you're saying here about people saying, because like, your argument is that you don't think it's bacon because it doesn't taste like bacon. Um, but if it really was indistinguishable, if you really couldn't tell the difference and somebody said, hey, here's plant-based bacon, eh, I'm not going to have a beef with it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I like what we did there. I like what we did there. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I, I completely agree. And again, how you alluded to that, like, uh, again, it, this, this I want to have a conversation with you because the way that you, you think and how you articulate this, it's, I knew that I was going to have an intellectual conversation with someone rather than someone just being aggressive with their point, if that makes sense. Like, I, I, it's very hard, <laughs> it's very hard sometimes in this space to, to have conversation with people that, um, uh, advocating for meat alternatives without them just trying to make you feel bad for eating meat, if that makes sense. Now, again, I understand your, your, your thing with the animal cruelty. I, I fully understand that. But again, you, you make really good points about like, when about like, one of my things about meat, as soon as I hear that, I'm like, uh, yeah, but it's not really meat. But as you said, yeah, almond milk. I'm like, well, actually, that's a very good point. So again, I love what you did with that. Um, so when it comes to like taste and like cost, mainly cost, um, mainly to produce, and then when it comes to actually buying it, what is the kind of difference between this um, meat grown from cells and plant-based things? Like, what's the sort of cost we're talking about here? Because obviously, a lot of people know about the plant-based alternatives. But we, we know about that. I know about that. Yeah. Um, but what's what we're talking about, like cost difference? Yeah, so right now, meat grown from animal cells, is called cultivated meat, is still pretty expensive. Um, it's more expensive than plant-based. It's more expensive than animal-based meat. Um, it, it's still more expensive. Uh, but you can see how there is like a Moore's Law effect that is taking place here. Uh, because if you look back, the very first cultivated burger that was ever served was in 2013 in London. The first time anybody ever served a burger. Uh, that was grown without having to slaughter a cow. And um, that burger cost, I don't know what it was in pounds, but it was more than 300,000 US dollars. So you, know, you think about that, that's like the most expensive burger ever consumed, right? I mean, it's pretty insane. And uh, I tell the story about that burger in my book, Queen Meat, which is really funny because the researchers actually, they had, they didn't want to ship it because you're shipping, you know, it's vast amounts. So they want to bring it with them from the Netherlands to London. And uh, he had to take it home from his lab to his home to go to London by train the next day because he was afraid of trying to get on a plane with it. And so he biked home. He biked him with a $300,000 burger in a, in a box on his bike. And I'm thinking, man, that is crazy. All right. But anyway, so the point is that back in 2013, you had a $300,000 burger. And today, these companies, that same folks who are doing this are saying that they're producing that burger for about 10 bucks. So of course, a $10 burger is still a lot more expensive than what a conventional burger is. But you can see how in less than a decade, the cost has come precipitously down just in the same way that, comp that computing has to the point where uh, you know, something like a smartphone um, 15 years ago would have cost a vast amount of money. Um, and now uh, to produce, like it would cost yeah. hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of dollars to produce. And now it's just something that we all have in our pocket. Actually, I read recently, I don't know if this is true, but it is true that I read it, that uh, the photo editing software that you have in Instagram in the year 2000 would have cost more than $2 million to have. Wow. And today it's just a free download. Mm. Um, and so like you see that there is this uh, effect that things come down in price when enough people do a lot of R&D to figure out how to do it. And that's what's happening in the cultivated meat space. So while 10 bucks for a burger is still a lot of money in, let's say, five years from now, who knows, maybe it'll be two bucks. We'll see. Mm, that's really, really interesting. And I think um, what your company's doing, this is something where, again, I found it very fascinating. And I was, a bit, I was, I was confused. I'm, I'm using the word confused, which is why I wanted to talk to you about this. Um, with what yeah. your company does, the Better Meat Co., you're using, I want to make sure I say this right, uh, microbial fermentation to grow meat like yeah. foods. What is this uh, microbial fermentation? I was, I was like trying to look into it. I couldn't quite understand what it was. Like I, again, on your website, it's very, they've got really good yeah. diagrams and stuff. And I understand it's obviously fermentation. I know what that is, but I still don't quite get what it is. So can you talk to me about what your company actually does with this process? Yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. So, all right, there's really like three kingdoms that you can make the meat experience from that we know of today. So the animal kingdom, so you grow animal cells, the plant kingdom, where you're taking things like peas or soybeans or weed and converting them into things that look like animal meat. But there is a third kingdom. It's called fungi. And uh, meat, uh, fungi are not plants. They're not animals. They're a completely different kingdom. And they are more oftentimes more meat-like in their texture than plants are uh, because they're a lot closer to animals. So if you think about uh, fungi, uh, they, like animals, they breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2. So we know, for example, that animals, or excuse me, plants do the opposite, right? Plants mm -hmm. breathe in CO2 and sequester and breathe out oxygen. Well, fungi are so much more similar to animals like us, so they breathe in oxygen, they breathe out CO2. Uh, 
uh, plants, uh, what they do is they put themselves in the sun and they photosynthesize and they get their nutrition that way. Mm -hmm. uh, fungi can't photosynthesize. They, like animals, have to search out their food and digest. Like that's how they get their nutrition, just you know, similar to what we do. It's not identical, but it, it's somewhat similar, at least compared to plants. And so the point is that fungi are not just in between plants and animals, evolutionarily speaking. They're way closer to animals. And there's a category of fungi called the filamentous fungi that really do produce um, a root-like structure called mycelium that really is often meat-like in its texture. Now, it's not made from animal cells, but it is still very meat-like in its texture without the need for much processing. So to get a pea to taste like meat, you've got to fractionate it and isolate it and extrude it. Like there's all these things you have to do to the pea to get it into, let's say, a Beyond Burger form so that it really tastes like a hamburger. But with this, with a whole category of fungi, it actually is pretty meat-like on its own. And so here's what we do. We take certain types of filamentous fungi, and these are microscopic fungi that we take, and we put them into a fermentation that where the fungi consume foods like potatoes and convert it into something that ultimately looks like a steak. So let me explain how that works, because I know it seems like magic. So think about a cow. A cow eats grass and converts that grass into a steak. But it takes a long time, more than a year of feeding that cow before she's slaughtered, and then you get the steak. What we do is take little microscopic fungi and feed them potatoes, and they convert it into something that looks like, a, or that ultimately looks like a steak, except instead of more than a year, it takes less than a single day. And the reason is because they grow really fast. So if you think about organisms, generally speaking, the larger the organism, the longer the time it takes to make a new one. So it takes an elephant a really long time to make more elephants, humans a little bit less time to make more humans. Uh, chickens, even less time to make more chickens. Rats and mice are really replicating fast. But when you get into the microscopic kingdoms, it's happening like this, right? It's really, really fast, doubling times in the hours as opposed to weeks or months or years. And so because of that, we can run a microscopic or microbial fermentation in which we can create this material that really does look like animal meat, that really does have the texture of animal meat, and we can flavor it to make it taste like animal meat except it doesn't have any of the problems that we've been talking about from animal welfare. It has a much smaller footprint on the land and it's better for you. So the protein that we produce, it's called a mycoprotein that we call Ryza and Ryza straight out of the fermenter with no processing. It's a whole food that is all natural, that has more protein than eggs, that has, it's a complete protein as well. It has more iron than beef, more potassium than bananas, more fiber than oats, and it naturally contains vitamin B12, unlike plant foods. So you're talking about a real superfood here that is the texture of animal meat that is nutritionally superior and is a whole food. I mean, it's a really, it's almost like a superfood and just watch it happen. It seems almost like magic to go from microscopic spores plus potatoes to a day later having something that really looks like raw chicken. And it's not magic. It's just science and it's fermentation science. And that's what we do here at the Better Meat Co. And then from there, what do you then do? Because I've seen it. What I'm going to do, uh, if it's okay with you, I'm going to get Mikey to, uh, yeah. for people watching on YouTube, to basically, while we're talking now, have it in the background, the video that you've cool. got going on so people can sort of see what this texture is like. It's a bit bizarre. I can't really describe, it looks like I've cooked up turkey or chicken mince. And that's yeah. what it looks like, the, 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 the texture of people to, to, to visualize this. So then what do you then do? Do you then take all this stuff and then compress it into a steak form and flavor it? Like, how do you then take this? Because I can't really describe what it looks like. It's just imagine, like just, just basically like mince, isn't it? It essentially looks like mince, like a, a yeah. conveyor belt of mince. So then you just compress it and turn it into things. I know it sounds probably yeah, a, a bit simple, but I don't really know what you do with it. <laughs> uh, it's not simple. It's actually, it, it's accurate. So what we do is we take that. So it, it looks like a mince because we chopped it into a mince. So, you know, it comes out and it's not in that chopped up form that you see, but we chop it up into that. And then, yes, that's exactly right. You can take it and turn it into a steak or a crab cake or a chicken breast or a uh, fish stick and more. It's just a matter of how you flavor it and how you hydrate it in order to get that product. And it's a pure microbial protein. Like this is a whole food, again, that is extremely nutritious and tastes great. It's all natural. Uh, and it's something that I think is going to be the future of food because it gives us the best of both worlds. You get the efficiency of not using animals, but you get the enjoyment and sensory experience as if you were getting animal meat. I'm really interested in this as well, because you, you spoke about being a complete protein. So again, for my audience that don't know what complete protein is, essentially, you've got amino acids 
So imagine amino acids as Lego building blocks. And essentially with these building blocks, you put these building blocks together and then you create a protein. Now, the problem with, with a lot of the um, uh, plant-based proteins is they're not complete proteins, meaning they've got some of these Lego blocks missing. Whereas a lot of the meat proteins have got everything in them. So the fact that you're saying this is a complete protein and it's got all the Lego building blocks is for someone like me that's a gym goer, really quite exciting. So my then thought with this is, can you then turn this into stuff like whey protein? Like, is this something that you're looking at doing? Because for me, yeah. it's like, well, actually this is then, because the problem is with vegan proteins, vegetarian proteins is they taste absolutely vile. Like you said, you've got like rice protein, hemp protein, pea protein, blah, blah, blah. But they taste pretty vile, let's be honest. So if you're saying you've got this thing that can essentially replicate meat, which again is very hard to do, you can flavor it how you want to. And it's this essential superfood. Is that something that you're doing, able to do, or look at doing in the future? Yeah. So first and foremost, uh, yes. And second, uh, there is a company called Perfect Day that is now making real whey protein without cows. So Perfect Day is a really fascinating company based here in Northern California, where I am. And they do a different type of fermentation than what we at the Better Meat Co. do. But Perfect Day is making real whey protein, not an alternative to whey, not a substitute for whey, not something that's kind of like whey. It is actual whey protein uh, that they produce through fermentation. And it is now being sold and you can, for, you know, if you, if you can, you can use it for whatever purposes you want, bodybuilding or anything else. And so you can get the real whey protein without cows with our products. Yeah, you can use it for that purpose. Uh, but one of the real benefits of our product is that it has the texture of meat. So in my mind, it would be kind of a shame to make it into a powder uh, because, you know, you're kind of destroying the real function here that we're going after, which is a meat like texture. Um, so there's other ways to make powders uh, that you can do that. And on the complete protein side, I do want to point out, so not only is it a complete protein, uh, which means, again, that it has all nine essential amino acids that humans can't make on their own, but if you look at the what's called the PD-COS score, uh, it's like protein digested, um, what is it, protein, the digestive, protein digestibility account, uh, adjusted score, the PD-COS score, uh, which is generally how uh, foods are rated on their protein digestibility with uh, zero being the worst and 1.0 being the best, like the co most complete protein. So something like casein is a 1.0 on that scale or egg whites are like a 1.0 on that scale, whereas beef is about a, a 0.92. Um, and uh, our protein, our rise in mycoprotein is a 0.96. So even better than beef in terms of the pd cost score. And so this is not only a complete protein, but it is something that's just really, really awesome for you to eat. And I'll tell you, I mean, this is not a scientific statement. It's just how I feel. But when I eat it, I truly feel better. I have like more energy. I feel good. It's a really great product, this fermented food. Um, and I think it's, uh, I think it's the food of the future. And uh, I do a lot of athletics. I run a lot. Um, we're proud to say actually this morning, I ran a 556 mile. So <laughs> I was like, you know, I felt like, you know, I felt like I'm 42 years old, man. And I'm running a sub six minute mile. I felt very good about it. And uh, I, I really think that my athletic performances are better when I'm eating our mycoproteins. I really believe that. And there are some, there is scientific literature about using mycoproteins and how it helps protein uh, muscle synthesis, like actually regrowing muscle after workout uh, in a very effective way. So if you look up mycoprotein in like the nutritional literature, uh, you actually find that it's actually proven to be quite good at enhancing muscle growth after workouts. No, I love that. Like I said, I'll do some research into that, that, that perfect, uh, perfect day whey protein. I'm having a look into that. Uh, I'm assuming it's going to be yeah, quite cool. expensive. because obviously whey protein companies are on the, on the niche side tend to be quite expensive. Like I've noticed that when you get these amazing, yeah. new, like, like I talked about earlier on about the burger, when you get like new whey proteins that are kind of a little bit different or innovative, they tend to be quite expensive, but I'm more than happy to have a little look, look into that. I'm, I'm fascinated. Um, so what does the future hold for you then, your company, like? A better meat co like i'm quite fascinated about this because you, you, you still class yourself like a startup which i'm assuming that's like less than five years old i'm assuming that's what your definition of it is so where do you see yourself in the next five or ten years like what is the plan for you with this because this was after me by the way until i was doing research into you i just assumed that you were a representative for the company i didn't actually realize that you would created this company which is why i was even more excited to actually talk to you about yeah. this so what is the big plan with this for you Sure. So yeah, I founded this company uh, three and a half years ago, and we're still a small company. We've got 16 employees, but we're a small company doing big things. And our goal is to create a fermentation facility where we have a fermenter the size of an office building. We don't want to just be producing uh, small quantities of our mycoprotein. We want to be producing millions and millions of pounds. We want a river 
of our rhizome lipoprotein flowing through the food industry to displace the need to raise and slaughter animals for food. We want to help reduce humanity's footprint on the planet. As I said at the beginning, the number one cause of deforestation is raising animals for food. And so if we are successful, I want to have actually the earth look different from space. That if you were to go up to the International Space Station and look down, I want the planet to literally look greener on land uh, than it does today because of what we are doing, that we can truly reforest the planet because we won't need so much land to be uh, de deforested for meat production. So that's the goal. And we're going to do that by creating massive fermentation facilities that enable us to produce huge quantities of our sustainable, nutritious, and delicious mycoprotein. And that's what we want to do, to be an ingredients provider of mycoproteins to the world and enable our food companies, the big food companies, to use fewer animals. Is there a big thing about uh, reforestation? I'm not saying specifically with your company, but just in general with this movement, because obviously it's all well and good um, getting rid of the, the, the animals per se that are taken up all this stuff. But is there a big push on the actual reforestation? Yes, that's what we need to do. It's not sufficient to, uh, to let's say, stop growing the corn and the soy that we're feeding to all these farm animals. We need to return that land to either forest or wetland or whatever it was before for climate purposes, for wildlife purposes, for habitat purposes. Uh, we are driving huge numbers of animals into their extinctive graves. I mean, we are one species that is driving thousands of other species into extinction right now. And the primary reason, the primary reason is habitat loss, that we are destroying these forests and these wetlands where these animals live. And so I think it's imperative that we reforest as much of the planet as we can to give wildlife a fighting chance. We should recognize that we are an important species, but we are not the only species on this planet. And that the other animals on this planet with whom we share it, maybe, just maybe these animals don't exist for us, but they exist with us here on this planet and we should give them a chance to exist as well. We can only do that once we stop taking up so much of their land for our agricultural purposes. No, I love that. Like I said, this has been a fascinating conversation. Like I said, when I had a chat with you off air, I didn't really know where we were going to go with this conversation. Um, like I said, I've always, uh, like I said, been a very big meat eater, but I've always been very consciously aware of how it's essentially impacting. And essentially what you're doing is offering an alternative that essentially gives people meat which is essentially what people want so it's giving them what they want yeah. and then actually giving a massive undertone of what the earth needs which i think is absolutely brilliant um paul where can people find out more information about you and your company what's your social media links and your website uh sure it's so nice of you daniel so people can visit us at bettermeat.co again that's bettermeat.co and if you're interested in reading my book queen meat you can buy it anywhere books are sold on amazon or anywhere else but the book's official website is just cleanmeat.com again that's cleanmeat.com Amazing. I'll get Mikey to put all the, uh, the links across the, uh, the bottom on the show notes for you as well. Uh, Paul, thank you very much for your time. This genuinely has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Daniel, it's a real pleasure to get to hang with you, man. I hope that we get to lift together someday. If you're ever in California, you can come on by and give me a lesson in the gym, all right? Honestly, this, this has been an incredible thing. Like I said, the, the amount of podcasts I've done now, and a lot of my guests are from America. I was literally having a, a joke in the gym yesterday, literally yesterday, about when I actually come back over to America, because I used to live in America. So I've got all my old friends to come and see. But then along with that, I need to do like a tour of America from all these podcast nice. guests where they're like, yeah, come and see me, come and see me. So I will hold <laughs> you. When, when I'm in California, uh, I will hold you to that, because okay. I, I need to see a mirror over the farm as well so i will awesome on. well you have a bunch of old friends to see and now you have a new friend to see so come on by we'd love to have you here at the fermentation facility we can show you how we turn microbes into meat and uh you can taste it no. we'll, we'll, we'll give you a, a, we'll give you your own steak you can I, have I, it all. I, I, an eight ounce steak i love that paul honestly thank you very much for your time <laughs>